Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Arise. Get up. Get moving. Not exactly words we always want to hear, especially after a long day's work or early, early in the morning. I expect that some of your kids woke you up this Christmas morning yelling, Mom, Dad, get up. Come see the presents under the tree. And you may not have been too enthused to heed their call to arise. Or maybe it's you who must go to your kid's bedroom and shout, Wake up! Get up! It's time for school! And they answer you with a moan and a groan and a pillow in your face. Whatever the case may be, the call to arise, to wake up, isn't always the most welcome call. But consider our Old Testament reading from Isaiah, the 60th chapter. The very first words are, Arise, shine, for your light has come. But how welcoming is the light, especially when asleep in darkness for so long? The world during the time of Isaiah was a dark world. But understand that the world wasn't dark because of the various problems that existed at the time. There were unfaithful rulers and kings and priests who were not doing their jobs. The people themselves were so mesmerized by idolatry and riches and wealth and power. And the worst part of it, of it all as Isaiah laments in the, uh, in the previous chapters before our text today, what that truth and what truth was, what righteousness and justice was all about, was lost. Tr uh, truth, the truth, the word of the Lord, it was not spoken, it was not taught, it was not preached or discussed in the streets, in the homes, or not really even in the temple. But this was not what made the world of Isaiah dark. See, the world was dark, and all of that other stuff was the result. The people were living in a dark world, and it led them to carry out the works of darkness. The people, the whole world, was dead in sin, darkened by the devil, and blinded by their own nature, and as a result, the deeds of darkness were everywhere. Isaiah 60 Arise, shine, for your light has come. And all of what we read in Isaiah 60 is prophecy. It's proclaiming an event of a future time where the darkness will be flooded out by light, where nations shall seek the light and kings revel in the light. A light where people of both near and far shall be delighted and filled and radiant on account of the radiance of the light. And the whole world will come to the light with gifts and praise and thanksgiving because the light will destroy the darkness forever. Now anyone who knows the Christmas story and the various events which come after Christ's birth knows what Isaiah is talking about. In a broad sense, Isaiah is writing about the coming of God in the flesh, Emmanuel, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. But he's also detailing a few specific things that will follow, like kings from afar arriving with gifts of gold and frankincense. But Isaiah is also writing about the church and the response that the people of God have on account of the epiphany, the light coming into the dark world. People from all walks of life, of all nations, gathering before the Lord where he speaks his word of truth and fills us with his body and blood for forgiveness and strength and faith. In a couple of weeks, we will see firsthand the Lord doing his work of salvation. Quite literally, the Lord is going to save someone in our midst who was born in the darkness of sin and death. The light of Christ will shine upon this individual through the cleansing and abundant waters of the sea. And in the name of our Lord and God, a child will be baptized and brought into the eternal family forever. We get to see that. We get to see the Lord saving someone in the way he promises through water and word. Now I know, I know that the temptation exists in our world today, a world where everyone can be a theologian, where everyone is an expert in doctrine and in biblical interpretation, yet where no one seems to agree on anything. I know the temptation exists to say that baptism is just a symbol. Everyone has their own opinions. 
their own truths. And the only truth that matters is what each person wants to believe in his or her own mind. But folks, there is only one truth. And let's face it, it's not your truth, it's not my truth, it's God's truth. God is the author of truth, he is the writer of right, and what each of us thinks doesn't matter so much because it doesn't change God and it doesn't change truth. And guess what? The darkness, it's all about existing outside of the truth of God. It's ultimately trying to live, trying to exist, dwelling in the deep darkness when, man's, when man lives outside of God and his word. Therefore, Jesus is proclaimed as the word who became flesh, the light that came into the darkness, you see. He is the truth, the light, and he is the only way to escape the darkness of self-deception, the darkness of the devil's lies, and the darkness of eternal death. And this must be the hardest thing for people, well-meaning people, to accept in our world today. That truth is not subjective. An invention of the mind. That it doesn't start here in the brain. See, truth starts out there. It starts with God. Difficult for our world with its postmodernism, what is truth approach these days. God is the author. He is the worker. He is the teacher. He is the only one who has the right, the authority, and the ability to speak truth. And what he says goes. What he says is what is, because he is God. Now, you can disagree with him. He gives you the freedom to disagree, but do you think you will change his mind? Do you think you will win a theological argument with the object and the writer and the teacher of all theology? The people of Isaiah, they lived in the darkness of sin and death. Their minds were controlled and enslaved by the darkness. Their thoughts and convictions deceived them. They were constantly being led astray by idols, by false prophets, by false teaching. They could not escape it because they could not escape the dark. See, the devil, the devil speaks only lies. He never speaks the truth. He can't. It's not in him. There is no truth in the devil, only lie and deception. And living in the darkness means that one lives by those lies, whether they think it's true or not. And just as with the world of Isaiah, who lived in the darkness of the devil, our world today lives in that darkness. Now we, the people of God, we have been enlightened. We have been shined upon by the light of Christ who, who came into the world to save us from our sins and bring us life and freedom from the dark. But the world still lives in darkness, follows the lies, and believes the deceptions. All you have to do is turn on the TV, look out the window, and the darkness of sin and death is there. Let me tell you something about the darkness. The words of the devil's lies are more attractive and enticing than any of our uh, individual, what I personally want to believe about Jesus, half-truths, which are all from the devil too. The lies are so enticing that even when we who have been enlightened, we can easily be led astray so that the Jesus we worship and the word which we profess to believe may not be entirely of the light. We can be pulled back into the darkness if we are not careful and diligent to remain in his word, to shut off the opinion voice of our heads and stop building our beliefs as Christians from the beliefs and opinions of the world. The world is dark. We ought not seek the wisdom of the dark, but only the wisdom of the cross, which has saved us from our sins. How do we know if what we believe, teach, and confess as Christians is the truth as God has given it, or if, it's, if we're believing at least in part in something else, in a truth conspired by other men, or, or which we ourselves conspired? How do we know that some theology, some doctrine taught in the church is of God, or it's from the dark? Because it can only be from God or from the dark. Maybe we have a conviction. How do we know it's a conviction of truth? or a conviction of our own invention. Again, during Isaiah's time, this was the problem. 
The people living in darkness could not see the light, but instead follow the darkness of their minds straight to the abyss. How do we know? Do we feel it? Do we just know? Is it because God told me in a vision? It's none of that. See, the devil will always try to convince you, especially you as a child of God, that the way the Lord chooses to reveal his will, to reveal truth to you, it's not satisfactory, the devil will say. It's incomplete. It's boring. It's too dry. The devil will always, always try to convince you that to know the truth means that you must reach inside of yourself to find it. In our men's Bible study, we will learn this lie and its name mysticism, the seeking of God from within the self. But truth cannot be found in the depths of your being. It's just not there. What you will find there is the darkness of your old nature wanting to retake your soul and drag you back into the dark. You will find the devil there in your, in your inner, so inner being, hard at work trying to turn you away from the Lord and reshackle you to the darkness of his lies. To know the truth, you must deny yourself. These are Jesus' own words. Deny your feelings, deny your convictions, and look to where truth is found. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And he has come to shine a light upon you so that you see the truth and that his truth set you free. God knew from the beginning that the only way to set you free was by sending his son to die. And as Jesus himself says in his own word, all the law and prophets testify, testify concerning him. So the answer to how do we know, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And I, I don't mean in some philosophical, Gnostic, mystical, look for Jesus in your heart, touchy-feely way. What I mean is look to Jesus where he said he would be found. And where do you start? You start with Scripture. These days, many like to say that the Bible can't be trusted, that parts of it are archaic, meant for another time, for another culture, that we need to modernize our interpretation to fit our culture today. I beg to differ. Some insist that because the Bible is written by men that it can't be trusted. Some have said that it's been translated so many times that what we have today is completely different than what was there 2,000 years ago, and it can't be trusted. Some insist that the Bible only contains God's word, that it isn't all God's word, and there, there are parts and words and passages and teachings that we can avoid if we choose. Some insist that we have gained so much knowledge and understanding and, and that science has proven this or that such that Scripture just doesn't matter anymore, that it's old news. I beg to differ on all points. To look to Jesus means that you look to the place where he desires to be found. And he desires to be found first in Scripture. And if we can't trust Scripture, then how in the world can we trust anything Jesus said? If we can't trust Scripture, how can we trust that he even died on the cross and rose again three days later? How can we trust that he truly atoned for the sin of the world if we can't trust Scripture? If we can't trust in Jesus then we are still in darkness. We are still in our sins. But we can trust in Scripture. Because God has given us all Scripture by his own breathing as holy men were carried along by the Holy Spirit, writing the thoughts and the voice and the heart of God with pen and ink. And because we can trust Scripture, we can trust the author of Scripture, God who became flesh and was visited by wise men, was baptized for us, suffered and died for us, and rose again for us. Arise, shine, for your light has come and has dispelled the darkness of doubt and fear and loneliness and shone his light upon you so that you might be the children of light, destined for eternity in the heavenly light of your salvation. And by his Holy Spirit, we are filled with his light so that our lives are living lights, giving thanks for his goodness through worship and prayer and spending time in church and before his word and sacraments and going out into the darkness of the world, shining the light of Christ to all who might see and believe. We all know the song of this little light of mine, 
a song we all sang as kids and maybe we still sing as adults. We shine as lights in this world only because our Lord, our light and life and salvation has forgiven us our sins, pulled us out of the darkness, and now continues to illuminate us by his word. May we, by his Holy Spirit, be those lights that shine. May we spend our days calling out into the darkness and along with Isaiah proclaim, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, has dispelled all the darkness. May our Lord's light forever shine in our hearts. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for prayer.